my father would come home at night with the wet canvas. Then, while we waited for supper to cook, we'd all sit on the couch and stare at it. I guess the same way families today watch television, we'd look at his painting. Nature was always my guide. My credo was that, first of all, a painting should show enthusiasm, then mood, then composition, form. I would see a beautiful scene and it would invoke feelings in me. It was those feelings I wanted to paint, rather than the scene itself. For 40 years, my father's passion was painting, even though the critics didn't appreciate his work and he couldn't earn a living by it. I had accumulated a great deal of experience in the 30s and 40s, and by the 50s, many secrets were becoming clear to me. As they did, I realized they weren't secrets at all, but simple truths in nature that had been there all along for anyone to see. To me as a child, he was a kind of magician. He could transform an ordinary country village into a painting ablaze with color. The St. Lucie Church was near our summer cottage in the Laurentians. He painted this site over 30 times in all seasons and moods. He loved painting Quebec landscapes and houses. They reminded him of his childhood village. My father was born in 1908 in Calvaria, a town in Lithuania. His mother had given birth to 15 children. He was the youngest. I remember summer evenings playing on the lawn in front of our house. My sister held me on her knees and sang me beautiful lullabies. We were on the lookout for mother. During the day, she sold household goods from door to door. In the evening, she trotted up the path with a basket full of food. I loved rummaging through that basket to breathe in the delicious smells. One day, my mother dressed me in my best clothes. We were going to the city for violin lessons. We had to cross fields smelling of lilacs. The sun was shining brightly. Excitement was in the air. I loved music, and I was finally going to learn how to play. We passed through the market square, through shaded old streets, and finally we arrived at the violin teachers. But he wasn't there. He had disappeared. Three days later, the war began. Music lessons were never mentioned again. The First World War had begun. It was 1914. The city smelled of death. In 
1918, when I was 10 years old, my mother died of the influenza epidemic that swept through Europe. My father, who was a religious teacher and scholar of the Talmud, had no time nor interest in me. He left me completely on my own. My childhood had ended. Every morning I got up at five and walked barefoot to the military hospital where I sold newspapers to the wounded soldiers. My sister used this money to buy food for us. Then I went to the synagogue to say prayers for my mother. After the Germans retreated, the town changed hands between the Poles and the Lithuanians. Sometimes the Poles brought the prisoners of war to the main square. The townspeople found the Jewish prisoners and beat them to death. I ran back crying to my father. He said something I would hear again and again in my life. These are hard times for Jews. Then he warned me not to go outside so much. A few years later, in 1921, my father, my sister, and I emigrated to Montreal to join up with my brothers who had come a few years before. We had reached the new world. I was 13 and full of optimism. I went to Bancroft School near St. Lawrence, but it only lasted a few months. We were too poor. My father and brothers shipped me off to a fur factory in Ottawa. I was devastated. After six months, I'd managed to save up enough to buy a bicycle. I rode all the way back to Montreal. My family expected me to do what other young immigrants were doing, learn a trade, become a cutter. For the next six years, I worked 10 to 12 hours a day in that factory. I could never forgive my family, so I lived on my own. But in the evening, I led my own life. I taught myself how to read English, and I devoured any book I could find, novels, biography, history. Then one evening, I met an art student at Cantor's Café. Through him, I enrolled in art classes at the Monument National. Soon, I began to meet other artists. Hermann Heimlich just arrived from Budapest, and from Russia, Alexander Berkovich. When I saw Berkovich's paintings, it became clear to me I wanted to be a painter. Van Gogh inspired me. I, too, could be an artist without formal schooling. When I walked the streets in gray weather, I had a feeling of loneliness, the kind one finds in the work of Utrillo. At other times, I felt tremendous enthusiasm, like the sweep of Soutine's art. I was creating my own alphabet, a new language unique and particular to me, and yet that could communicate my feelings to everyone. Then the depression hit. The single men were laid off from the factory. But my passion for art was stronger than ever. Some days I wouldn't eat so that I could buy canvas and oils. I spent many nights sleeping in the Jewish cemetery. I rested in peace, so to speak. When I managed to get 15 cents together, I would have a treat. I'd buy a loaf of bread and some cheap cigars, go up to Mount Royal and spend my day sketching. I spent a lot of time in the Mount Royal soup kitchen. At first, I was too shy and proud to go in, but my stomach got the better of me. I met some wonderful people there. We had our own club, our special table. I remember a Dr. Klinger, a PhD in Shakespearean languages. Borenstein, you have the makings of a hobo. Team up with me. We will ride the rails. All you need is five dollars to be a hobo. But I couldn't make it. I didn't even have the five dollars. On Sundays, I swam and sketched on St. Helens Island.
One evening as I was heading home, a hobo called out to me. Hey, you. You look like Jesus Christ. You're carrying your own cross. <laughs> He'd mistaken my easel for a cross. When I finally arrived at the soup kitchen, too late for anything to eat, I thought of what that hobo had said. He was right. In some ways, my easel was my cross. I began exhibiting my work, and people said, he has talent, but he's uncontrolled. But how can I control myself when everything around me is so beautiful? I met him in 1938. There was an exhibition of his work at the Montreal Museum, and I was very much impressed by the painting. I was introduced to him, and I told him that I liked the work very much, and uh, so he says, would you like to see more? <laughs> I went to uh, his studio. And his paintings really excited me. It was very colorful and very um, spontaneous and very honest. There was a lot of honesty in this man. He painted uh, subjects and, and things that he liked, uh, never thinking about uh, will it sell or won't it sell, that didn't bother him. And uh, I admired these qualities in his work and in him. And he was exciting, he was different from other people. He loved painting in the winter time. And he would stand in front of the subjects, of course he couldn't wear gloves because uh, uh, and then he couldn't hold his brushes. And he put probably so much uh, energy into it that he was able to paint for several hours. But then when he felt the painting was almost finished, then he would start feeling cold, you know, and then he would uh, have to stop. I fell in love with his painting, and I said that to him. And when he heard that I liked his painting so much, he said after meeting me three times, he said to me that he was going to marry me. I met Sam's father. He said to me, why do you want to get uh, together with a man like Sam Bornstein? Because he, he probably will never make a living and uh, he may end up in jail yet. I took him to my house. I lived with my sister and brother-in-law, but he, he didn't fit into my family. Like he would put his foot on the, the coffee table. <laughs> I want to have a normal life with the woman I love. So what if I can't earn a living? So my brother-in-law said, this man is crazy. I mean, you can't possibly think of, uh, of seeing him again, you know? Anyway, the family was very upset. But he was a very honest man, and he had lots of integrity. And I liked that on him. So I decided that uh, I wanted to marry him for his qualities. All his life, he had uh, dreamt about uh, spending time in Paris. Well, in the spring of 1939, we sold uh, all our belongings and uh, arrived in Paris. Uh, and it was uh, full spring there already. Everything was in bloom. Paris, at last. The galleries were full of Van Goghs, Vlamings, Kokoschkas, Soutines. Before, I had only seen them in books. Now I stood before them. I could almost touch them. We spent several months until August. He painted uh, every morning and every afternoon. Sam had painted uh, 70 paintings. The war was already in progress and uh, there were, it was not safe to remain uh, in U Europe. And we decided we would return to Canada. Borenstein went to France and now exhibits 40 canvases. He didn't paint France. He painted Borenstein. I don't know if that was a compliment or if it was a criticism, but uh, he said he didn't. Most painters, when they go to Europe, their palette changes, but Sam painted uh, in his own way. I'd finally found someone who believed in me. 
my dear wife Judith earned the living working part-time in her sister's factory. I painted intensely every day. I stopped people on the street, asked them if I could do their portrait. Judith cooked them a meal as payment for sitting. He used to paint his father sometimes. And he was an old, old, old man. And his father must have been 50 years old when he was born. And um, he always felt kind of very different from the rest of his family. He could never relate to his father because his father was like, like in another world. And his mother died when he was little. So he just was like extra. He felt that his father didn't take care of him. And doing the portrait, this person becomes yours in a sense. So his father served his purpose. The artist always feels that if art can come out of it, then everything is vindicated. In the summertime, uh, we, uh, Sam wanted to paint uh, the Gatsby. I was working at the time. Somebody had to make a living. I was working and I had three weeks holiday and I followed him. He spent three months there. And we met Gita Kaiserman. And uh, Gita only painted indoors. And uh, Sam said to her, well, you've come all the way to Gatsby. Why don't you paint the scenery here? I had been brought up in a way to think of art as a social thing, and I thought, well, if I go inside my head or even inside a room, that's, that's the way I want to paint. And I, I saw this man looking out into the open sea with nothing on the horizon, and I thought, what? What an absolute contrast between me sitting poked up into this little room doing the lady peeling potatoes and, and Sam going out and looking outwards into nothingness, I thought. Of course, there was light and there was sky and there were a lot of other things, but I didn't understand that at the time. He thought I was crazy and I sure thought he was crazy. Then when we came back, we realized that I was pregnant and uh, couldn't go out to work anymore. So Sam had to try to make a living. So Dr. String gave us his old jalopy. We got quite a lot of paintings for that old car. And we rented a little store on Victoria Avenue to open an antique store. He had bought a number of things. But he had no uh, patience. Like, he would go in in the morning, and nobody would come at the first hour or so. So he would close up the store and put a sign outside, be back in one hour. And then people used to phone me to the house and say, what happened? We're here in front of his store, and the, the store is closed. So I said to the people, you better don't wait, because he probably won't come back. So it was a complete uh, failure, this store. It lasted six months. decided to um, try to make a living as a taxi. He drove for one year and he worked nights. Uh, in the daytime he painted and he took a few hours of sleep and then night he drove out. But it wasn't for him, he didn't like that. He um, decided to sell other artists' uh, paintings. He was very friendly with Goodrich Roberts, uh, Dr. A.Y. Jackson, uh, Lesmer, Wally, Cosgrove. He was like the middleman. They gave him work and he would sell it to the galleries and make himself a 10, 15% profit. And that's how he earned a living for us. I uh, remember when his first child was born, Norman, he was very, very happy. We spent every summer in the Laurentians. The day the children finished school, we loaded up the station wagon and headed out to Lac Brulee. 
We wouldn't return until September. An old schoolhouse, Le Vieille Col, was our cottage. Driving up to our country house was always an adventure for us kids. Normally that trip would take probably about an hour and a half. But with Daddy, you never knew how long. Sometimes it took three hours, sometimes four. We would stop and we would see a scene that he thought would be good to paint and, and he'd have to look at it. And we would always stop to have a picnic and look at the clouds in the sky. He preferred to paint on gray days. He would tell us that too much sunlight washed out the color. When it was raining, and he couldn't paint outdoors, he would ask either Joyce or me or Mummy to go to the abandoned hotel and pick wildflowers. Sam loved only genuine things. I loved his still lifes, the richness of his colors, the strong ultramarines, the crimson reds, the blues, conveyed a sensuality provoked by the wildflower and the great love you felt for those flowers. The summer studio was a chicken coop. I can remember posing for my portrait in there. It was very hot and humid, and all the kids were out playing on the beach and having fun while I had to sit still for hours. I'd stare at the colors on the floor that fell from his palette. And that way, I could forget that I wanted to be somewhere else. I grew up with Bornsteins in the house, and so did most of my friends and my, my cousins. I would be about six years old or eight years old or even, you know, 10 and 11. There was a certain quality to these paintings that, that made us want to touch them. They were almost like, like, like a food. They were bumpy and they were thick. They, they were like, it was like strawberry jam and ice cream and blueberry jam. Whenever we would pass the paintings, little fingers would, would touch them. It was a great temptation. During the winters, I continued to paint Montreal street scenes. And when money ran low, I would take a turn at dealing in antiques and paintings. Our living room, where the light was best, became my winter studio. I shared it with the grand piano. The children would practice piano while I painted. No one seemed to mind this smell of paint permeating the house. In the 50s, a Bornstein painting in most houses in Montreal really did violence to just about everything people owned. You, know, you could hang it with a Blamec or a Dufy or a Van Gogh even, but uh, not with some of the art that, that, that people quite often had here. In 1961, he had a show at the Klinkoff Gallery and soon after at the Penthouse and West End Galleries. And then came the 1966 retrospective of his work at Sir George Williams University. 45 canvases were shown, 30 years of work. The Sunflowers of 1953 is one of his best. Pigment laid on with a trowel, but expertly laid.
There's a kind of generosity. He will apply color in such a way, thick colors. He will not uh, be miserly about using color. He would just slap it on and shape it and push it around and until it falls into place, add, take off, and so on and so forth. You can see the whole action of painting, like in the New York action painters, but in a different way. Here, this action is not something in itself. It is brought towards a painting that has a subject and has a mood. I saw Sam painting very frequently. He painted rapid as almost a possessed man. I believe there was a fear that something very vital may escape him. And I also felt that there were certain elements in the paintings that were reaching far beyond the visual. He worked from the heart. A tree was not just simply a wood and branches. It was uh, life, you know, rushing from the bottom up into the air. He had a great singleness of purpose. He wanted to be a painter, and nothing seemed to stand in his way. For some time, my father had been suffering from terrible back pains. After a year of tests, it was finally diagnosed as cancer. On December 20th, 1969, he died. His paintings hang in numerous museums across Canada and in many private collections. I remember him as a young man. He was a handsome young man. He used to wear a white suit and he really looked very nice. And uh, he, he enjoyed life. Like he, you know, he, he liked looking at pretty women and he liked talking and kidding around. I mean, uh, and he, he loved beautiful things. Well, he was a wonderful storyteller. And he would, uh, when we, uh, many people invited him to their uh, gatherings at night, very often he would make up stories and say that uh, it happened to him. But only I knew that it really didn't. And he had everybody laughing and uh, he kept the conversations going. And he would laugh. And he the, the best audience for his stories yeah. was him himself, yeah. and he, he would, would laugh so hard that he would cry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the thing that I remember the most was wherever we were, Daddy would look up into the sky and he'd say, Don't you see that little animal up there? Don't you see the way that. Yeah, that well, yeah, and we would watch them, yeah. how they changed and they turned. Yeah. 